So hello everyone, my name is Oliver Stock and I'm pleased to welcome you to a new GreenMet webinar today in collaboration with GreenBite. We will combine our expertise and give you an overview about two crucial aspects of asset management, the technical and the financial asset management of renewables. We will focus on the following subtopics, the investment management process for renewables, where we will give an overview about the tasks that arise in asset management but mainly we will focus on how to ensure efficient asset management as first from the technical and then from the financial point of view. We have already received interesting questions during the last days, but you can also hand in your specific questions now during the webinar directly via the tool. We will give our best to answer as many questions as possible, but please accept our apologies if we are unable to respond to each question. Now, let me introduce you to your experts for today, Christos Kaidis, Technical Sales Engineer at GreenBite. Hi, Christos. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thank you for being with us today, Christos. Um, for GreenMatch today with us, Tobias Bitterly, co-founder and our CPO. Hi, Tobias. Many thanks for joining. Hi. Thank you and welcome, everybody. Yeah, we start uh, with an overview about the investment management process of renewables uh, from the investor's perspective. So it uh, starts with the screening, which aims to obtain the broadest possible selection of projects. The key for this is to maintain a clearly specified external image, which should be aligned with the previously defined investment strategy. You come then to the pre-evaluation, which is mainly about the quick evaluation of relevant projects in order to select the pertinent projects for which the investor will send an indicative offer to enter into a detailed evaluation phase. This detailed evaluation phase corresponds to the next step of the investment management process, the due diligence. There, it comes to risk assessment and structuring, negotiation, and best case, to the investment itself. Uh, once the project has been successfully implemented and started operation, we arrive at the step which will be in our main focus today, the asset management. Asset management of renewables consists of tasks regarding technical performance, financial performance, stakeholder management, and of course, reporting towards management and investors. At this point, uh, I will start with the first poll. We would like to know where our audience has currently uh, the main focus. So I would highly appreciate um, if you could participate in this short poll. So are you mainly focusing the technical performance of your assets, the uh, financial performance, the stakeholder management, or the management and investor reporting? So we take just a few seconds in order to have enough replies for yeah, interesting reply selection. Right, thank you. As we can see, most of you focus mainly on the technical and the financial performance, but investor uh, investment and management uh, reporting are also crucial to you. Um, thank you for your participation. Now we come to the tasks in asset management. As you can see, we divided these in three categories. So the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, regarding the financial performance, we usually divide them into parts. Accounting is, a, yeah, uh, is more about the past and the financial uh, part is more about today and the future. Uh, due to the versatility of the task, the asset manager has a large amount of data to overview. This data should be linked via interfaces. Perhaps the greatest challenge for the asset manager is to maintain an overview and work as efficiently as possible. Therefore, digitalization offers many opportunities. But before we start to show you efficient working methods, we will run our second poll. Uh, this one will be about your current key challenge. So we will start it right now. So is your current key challenge about the large amount of data in asset management? Is it about a general increase in complexity? Is it due to diversified portfolios? 
or maybe the standardization and the linking of tools. Once again, we will wait a few seconds. Just take a chance and participate, please. Thank you. Okay, very interesting. Uh, we see there are various challenges currently that are affecting our audience. Interesting. We will uh, yeah, now see how efficient techni uh, technical asset management is possible. So that will be the part of Christos. Christos, up to you. Just give me a second. So. Yep, you should now be able to um, see my screen. And before uh, we go to the platform, we'll start with a small introduction. First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, being here. And thanks uh, to the Green Smart, Green Maths team for inviting me. So uh, we're here to talk about asset management. And I thought that there couldn't be a better way to start from the very root of it by using the scope of asset management as defined by uh, the Institute of Asset Management. Um, and what you see here in the very bottom of this uh, visualization of this mapping of the different elements of the scope is the asset information. So the cornerstone for both the decision-making and the life cycle delivery is coming through the information collected by the assets, it being the static information, the asset properties, but also, and more importantly, the data coming from the asset. And we see more often than not that the data available or the format available is the one dictating the decision-making process, while it should be exactly the other way around. You should be control and having the decision-making process in place should be the one defining the amount and the kind of data, the kind of asset information that you will be collecting and processing from the assets. When it comes to the technical asset management that we will be focusing for the next 20 minutes or so, we will mostly go through a specific workflow, what we call the portfolio manager's workflow. Let me quickly talk you through the steps. So we will start from looking at our key performance indicators on a portfolio level, and then go down to specific assets. So we will look how we can go from a portfolio down to a site level, down to a turbine or a component level. We will also try through a preliminary investigation to identify what kind of issue are we dealing with, even though it may not be the final answer to our problem, but definitely lead us to the right direction. Then this will be escalated depending on the organization type to the site manager, to a specialist that will perform an inspection or an extra layer of analytics. And what we will be saying in steps one until four is something we can call a post factum analysis. So we are looking at the data of the past. We visualize this information. We try to derive conclusions from that. But it's all about the data of last week, last month, last quarter, last year. And even though it might be quite common, that uh, you're used to be receiving a monthly report from your service provider telling you what went well or what went wrong. Um, the data capabilities nowadays allows you to go further, allows you to go more detail, allows you to, if you want, learn from what went wrong last month, learn from the mistakes of the past, and make sure you're able to become proactive. We see renewable energy portfolios scaling quite aggressively. We see diverse technologies. And if you would like to be on the driver's seat, if you would like to be on top of your game, then you need to add 
automation and proactive layers in your routines. So eventually having learned the lessons of our post factum analysis in steps one until four and set up the stage for becoming proactive for a system flagging issues early on, then this will close the loop by eventually monitoring those flags raised by the system. It will allow us to react faster or to even be proactive to be there before the failures happen, which will reflect eventually on our key performance indicators. I'm giving you, giving you a bit of uh, extra seconds to digest the workflow because we will click through it and we will get back to it at the end so that we can uh, revise what we've seen. With that, I will switch to the Greenbyte platform and start this journey in uh, the portfolio manager's workflow. So as we have seen in the very first slide, the basis for all that is the data collection and harmonization. So this is an example of a renewable energy portfolio in Europe. And by collecting and harmonizing the data tags, the naming, we achieve something seemingly easy, but with quite some work on the data integration side behind it. Something as easy as how much energy have we produced month to date from our turbines and how much we have produced from our uh, inverters in this case in total. And this will be the starting point of our journey in the workflow of a portfolio manager. So and let me zoom in so that you can see it a bit better. What we have here is on a year to date basis uh, to make the connection with the previous view, how much energy we have produced year to date and how does this compare to our expectations along with some high level key performance indicators on a portfolio level. And the next step on this, let's call it top to bottom analysis or drilling down the different levels of our portfolio will be to be looking at those key performance indicators on a site by site level. So what do we see in this example? We see how much energy we have generated so far and how does it compare to our expectations, to our budget. But not only that, we also see how much we could have produced in an ideal world, how much we could have produced if we were performing 100% and if our availability was 100% as well, which is hardly ever the case. So the gap between the theoretical and the reality, the ideal case, and the actual energy export is allocated to lost production due to downtime, lost production due to performance, and lost production due to curtailment, or if you prefer, due to external interventions that are neither a fault, neither a suboptimal performance situation. And by sorting, on those KPIs, that will lead us towards the next step that will uh, allow us to focus on a specific asset to investigate further, either by looking at KPIs on an absolute lost megawatt hours uh, fashion, or by looking at KPIs um, in a normalized fashion, like the more mainstream, if I might call them, like time-based availability or performance index. So by clicking on the wind farm we would like to focus on, that will bring us on a wind farm dashboard. So that will give us key performance indicators on a turbine per turbine level. So we went from portfolio to specific wind farm. And now from a wind farm level, we start looking at the key performance indicators per turbine and we are trying to answer the three short questions, what, where, and when. So by what, is it more of a downtime issue we're dealing with, 
or more of a performance issue where with specific asset with specific turbine and when it comes to when looking at those kpis over time we can identify which month in the period of let's say last 12 months we're looking at uh, we have been suffering if i might use uh, the expression uh, the most losses drilling further down both in terms of downtime on the left hand side of our screen or performance losses on uh, the right hand side of the screen focusing on the left so starting with our downtime events we can which we can visualize as a timeline okay we have losses due to downtime now we're trying to identify what kind of downtime are we dealing with and in order to draw conclusions on that uh, what we can do is cluster the downtime events based on different approaches so we can very easily identify the frequency rates of its specific uh, fault code in our turbines together with the total downtime that this specific fault code has resulted to and the total lost production that this specific fault code uh, has generated to our wind farms from a service contract management perspective we can allocate those events to our contractual category so if it's manufacturers liability if it's an environmental or a utility related event or other visualizations again depending on the start point of each one if we're talking about a portfolio manager it might make sense to normalize all the events across different technologies into the IC61400-26 um, guideline, as we see here, or from a reliability engineering perspective, if you prefer, we can allocate those uh, downtime events to specific components or subcomponents of our wind turbines. Uh, what we have done here is uh, utilizing the rdspp wind turbine component uh, taxonomy allocating the events to the specific components and using a similar type of aggregation in terms of frequency how much time we've lost and how much downtime we have suffered because of uh, the specific events this is on the downtime side of things and if we look at uh, the performance uh, we can start from something uh, as basic as uh, plotting the power curves, something that uh, many of you might be already familiar with, and use this as a starting point uh, for further investigation. What do we see here, for example, turbine three in this small wind farm of three turbines uh, performing below uh, the other two? And the same way we went from a portfolio to a wind farm and from a wind farm to wind turbine level we will uh, go to turbine number three and have a closer look on how turbine three has been performing uh, using some uh, smarter visualizations or some more applicable tools for example a colored scatter per week or looking for example at the performance per wind speed beam and per sector like what we see here uh, the performance seems to be lagging behind from the southwest compared to uh, to the southeast wind direction. What we have seen in this uh, quick overview of the platform is how we have collected our data, structured our KPIs in a way that we will easily go through from a portfolio to a wind farm to a wind turbine uh, level but as you have noticed we have achieved that by actively clicking through the platform by actively looking at the color coding of the platform the key performance indicators and using a bit our uh, gut feeling or expertise uh, to tell that okay this kpi looks suspicious this power curve plot seems uh, to indicate that turbine number three uh, is uh, doing less compared to the others. Um, 
but when it comes to scalability, when it comes to having a large and diverse portfolio, this is not the way to go. So you cannot expect yourself or your employees to be actively clicking every day or every week through the KPIs and identify uh, what's wrong in terms of downtime or in terms of performance. So in order to add a proactive layer, in order to add an automation which will eventually allow scalability, this brings us to the alert uh, module of the platform. So in essence, we are replacing the human clicking, the pair of hands and eyes with an automated routine, which is continuously in the backend performing this, uh, this work for us. So to show you an example, if we look at the comparative performance alert that I have set up uh, for us to look at today, we want to apply that throughout our full portfolio. So we're looking at all our turbines. We have an evaluation period of a rolling 24 hours. And uh, what we are after is for turbines that are not stopped, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't be evaluating the performance. Uh, we're looking at each individual turbine compared to the other turbines in the same wind farm. So we are comparing for a rolling 24 hours the difference between the performance of a single turbine and the average performance of the other turbines in, uh, uh, in the wind farm. And if one turbine is underperforming more than 10%, this is defined by the user. So you could as well define it to be 5% then this will trigger an alert. This will trigger an alert in the platform. This will notify you via email or mobile app, whatever you are more uh, familiar uh, with, whatever you prefer to use in your uh, working routines. So with the alert tool, we are actually automating the click-through process, the post-factum analysis we've seen before with the two significant elements, one is the automation bit, and also the second element is the continuous evaluation. It's not about expecting a weekly report or a monthly report. This is happening on a rolling 24 hour basis, which allows you to act faster. Now, one could argue that this, this is still a post factum analysis, but it's a big difference having it on a 30 day uh, interval and having a 24 hour. Uh, rolling evaluation. Now, comparing a value to a threshold or comparing uh, turbines to each other, it's still uh, very useful. But of course, uh, it doesn't go much further than uh, linear mathematics, and there is much more than that. So, when it comes to a component temperature, you can do something as simple as comparing a temperature to a threshold but this still might provide you the information you want a bit too late in the game. So that brings me to the next and more advanced practice when it comes to uh, early detection of component failures, uh, which is actually utilizing machine learning algorithms for very early detection of uh, failures. Uh, I will spare you the technicalities, uh, we're talking about an uh, artificial neural network uh, model, which is, uh, in essence, simulating what the healthy behavior of a component is supposed to be based on historic uh, data. And then it could be continuously comparing the result of the algorithm with uh, the actual uh, component, uh, with the actual component temperature. And when there is a deviation of a specific pattern detected, it will raise a flag. And based on the actions taken on similar situations in the past, it will also come with recommendations of what the actual issue uh, might be in uh, our portfolio. To 
start wrapping it up, uh, what we have seen is going very quickly from a portfolio level down to a wind farm level, down to a specific turbine or turbine component level. We added the proactive layer and the automation layer with the alerts, and we have also seen some uh, more advanced practices in the predictive analytics uh, side. To close the loop, we go to the monitoring, to the last step of our workflow, which I will come back to in a minute, where we are actually seeing what's going on right here, right now, in our portfolio of wind farms, active turbine faults, so this is relating to our downtime component, and then the result of the alert example that we saw just before. So we ask the system to continuously monitor our portfolio, and if one turbine is deviating significantly compared to its peer group, we would like to be notified. And we have a few uh, that fall under these conditions. Let me just open one uh, of the examples. So the system, on top of triggering a flag, it will also tell us why. So it will remind us the conditions, so the performance is deviating significantly as we have asked it to actively check for. And here we see the visualizations. Here we see uh, turbine number five being the blue line in our graph, and then the average of the rest of the turbines being the red line, where we see that for the flagged period, turbine number five has been the one being uh, significantly uh, below uh, the other turbines uh, in the wind farm. So if we go back to our uh, starting point, this is the workflow we saw before, the platform demo, and the one we are concluding uh, this uh, uh, technical asset management example. Uh, so we started from our KPIs on the portfolio level. We navigated horizontally and vertically, if you want, in our portfolio. So we went from a portfolio down to a wind farm, wind turbine level. Uh, we identified downtime or performance issues. And that brings us to eventually when we have cornered the problem to an escalation. What do I mean by escalate? The platform will help you to go from a portfolio of 1,000 turbines down to those five or 10, or down to this one out of 50 wind farms that requires your attention. When it comes to the ultimate answer, when it comes to the final solution, of course, uh, in some cases, there might be something extra needed. It might be, for example, if you identified you're losing a lot of production due to gearbox faults, it might be that uh, it's a series of inspections uh, required and there are uh, very advanced and experienced professionals out there that are specialized in performing uh, this kind of uh, tasks. Our alerts will give us a heads up, will add the scalability and automation layer, will feed our monitoring routines and eventually if all goes well this will have an impact on our lost production due to downtime, a positive impact uh, the way uh, we go through. So this is a, let's call it an agile workflow, a continuous improvement workflow where you identify issues through the KPIs, you detect them as early as possible through the alerts and monitoring the alerts, and eventually you become more proactive and you keep your losses down to a reasonable level. So what we have seen so far has been a lot of megawatt hours and uh, lost megawatt hours. And uh, now it's time to approach again asset management, but uh, to see some uh, euros uh, in the presentation, go to the financial asset management side of things. And uh, Tobias will uh, show us the money. Tobias will guide us through the financial asset management a bit of the webinar today. Thank you very much, Christos, for this interesting presentation. Um, I now have the honor to switch to the financial part. 
and I would, would like to start with another short survey. And this is, is digitalization already a strategic priority to your asset management? I will give you again some seconds to answer. You can answer yes, yes, but not on a satisfying level or no, not yet. Thank you. I can see most of you, for most of you, it is already a strategic priority, but I can also see that you're not all satisfied. Um, let's hope we can improve on that point. And I would now like to dig deeper into the financial part. I would like to start with the goals of the financial asset management part. As Christos already mentioned, we are now talking not so much about megawatt hours, but more about the euros. And one of the main, main goals of the financial asset management is basically to track the financial performance of your asset, to see is the asset performing in that way as you planned it when you bought it. Um, on the financial side, can you reach your KPIs that you um, initially planned? Also, it's really important to optimize your equity distributions to see when can I make which distributions in order to prevent future liquidity gaps. Uh, another big part of the financial asset management, of course, is the reporting for all the stakeholders. Uh, you usually have a lot of different stakeholders that want to see different reports. And there it's really important to have a good data um, base to create all those reports. Um, and in the end, it's also important to provide accurate data for the financial forecasting uh, to really be able to plan the future cash flows of your investments. Now, what is important to do that efficiently? Most importantly, it's all about the comparability, the reliability, and the continuity of data and results. So it's really about um, get your data in a as standardized way as possible. And for that, we have some tips that we um, that we saw in with our clients. What is important to achieve that? One important step. It's usually the first step is that you have a clear assignment of tasks between the transaction and the asset manager, because the asset management actually starts already in the before the transaction. It gets a lot easier if the transaction manager already um, sets the project up in a way that the asset manager can reuse. And it's really important to um, assign the tasks be between the two, um, between the transaction and the asset manager in order to make sure that work is not done um, twice, that the asset manager can rely on the data that the transaction manager already uh, put in place. Then it is really important to use a standardized financial model. Um, usually, especially in larger companies, you have different transaction managers. You maybe have multiple asset managers. And if the asset manager gets different financial models from the different um, transaction managers, often also between technologies, you get another financial model for wind another one for PV projects, maybe even for each country, a different model. And that makes it really hard for the asset manager to collect all the data and to standardize the data. So key, uh, the key point is really to have one standardized financial model for all technologies, for all countries, um, and for all the transaction managers in the company. Then more on the accounting side, um, it's also important to have as standardized data as possible. Um, it's not always possible to have a fully standardized chart of accounts across all SPVs. It depends on the countries. It depends on the partners you have in those countries. Um, but what we've seen so far is that it's much easier is if you have this accounting data as standardized as possible. 
Um, one point to reach that is, of course, to not have too many different partners. If you have uh, a different accounting partner for each your each of your projects, uh, that usually makes it harder because they use different software. They they provide you with the data in a different format, and that makes it even more complex to standardize the data. So usually, the more partners you have, the more complex your data set will be. And last but not least, of course, if you use different software solutions, what we actually recommend, because we think you should use the software solution that fits the purpose the best, um, but then you have to make sure that uh, interfaces between those software solutions exist, and you really have to think about which software solution should provide you with what kind of data, and how, do, how, how are these software solutions connected to each other. Now, I would like to go a little bit into the process of the financial asset management. As I mentioned before, financial asset management starts before the transaction. Usually, um, you see that on the right-hand side, the first, the first part is the creation of the transaction plan. What you usually do there is you create a financial model. You model all the assumptions of the project for the full lifetime of the project, and you try to to evaluate the project, to um, find the optimal asset purchase price, to financially structure your project, and to, um, in the end, to get the price you you are um, you are able to pay for this project in order to still reach your expected return. So basically, that is the base for your financial asset management that you have this transaction plan. Then if you actually bought the project and you get actual data, let's assume that the, we have the project since one year, then we start collecting first financial data about the project. So we get actual data from the accounting um, partner usually, and we start to record these actual figures. Um, compared to the technical part, we actually don't need daily or hourly or even um, 15 minute data maybe, but for us, we usually start with monthly data because uh, you don't have daily data on accounting level available usually. So what we take here is more like a long-term approach to really um, observe the project in the long-term and not on a, in a real-time way. Then um, in order to calculate most of the financial KPIs, you, you most often uh, need a financial plan from transaction until the end of the project. For example, if you want to calculate the return, the IRR of an investment, you always need data for the full lifetime of the project because you have the investment in the beginning at the transaction and then you have positive cash flows in the future. So even if you if the project is already running for let's say 10 years, you still need this past data in order to calculate the IRR of your project. In order to reach that, um, it is important to create this combined financial plan uh, as, as signaled here. So basically for the past, you have your past data that is coming from the accounting. And for the future, you again have to make a plan. You have to try to model the future cash flows as accurate as possible. And if you combine those two figures or those two plans, then you can again calculate the actual return that you are expecting from the today's perspective. Now let's talk a little bit more about this updated plan. Why do you need this, up this updated plan? There are mainly two, um, two reasons. The first reason is based on these past financial figures that you get from accounting, similar to as Christos um, showed us for the technical part, you can learn from past um, data. So if you, for example, see that in the past you had much lower production uh, than expected or than um, initially planned, then you should now revise your plan for the future um, and 
you can do that by um, updating your plan from today for for the future. Same um, same occurs for let's say for the OPEXs, for example. If you see um, my contract is over now, I have to renegotiate a new cost contract. It will be higher now. Then you have to take this into account. Then the second important part to mention are macroeconomic factors. Uh, for example, electricity price markets are quite volatile. So um, for sure you will have a new electricity price forecast available, which you will have to consider for your updated plan. The yield curve is always changing. Maybe that's relevant for your project as well. Um, and also inflation expectations, all those macroeconomic factors you have to um, consider for your plan as well. And in the end, um, this combination between the actual figures and the updated plan for the future, this is always the best estimate for the actual achievable IRR, internal rate of return. So basically what you're doing in the financial asset controlling is you're always trying to, to calculate or recalculate the um, best estimate for the achievable return based on based on um, past data, past financial data, and this updated plan for the future. And the second point you can do with your updated plan, that's um, the impair impairment, the revaluation of your project. So basically on each point of time, you can you can reevaluate your project and you can calculate the value of the project as of today. And you do that by using your updated plan for the future and try to calculate the value it has today if you would sell it uh, at a certain hurdle IR today. Now, I would like to um, step into our software green match to show you how this process uh, can look like in our software. I will start with our valuation part. Our software mainly contains different modules. The first module is this valuation part, which is all about financial planning for the future. Then we have the, the asset controlling part, which is about combining past data with future data and the portfolio part where you can aggregate multiple SPVs on the portfolio level. So let's go into detail of my example project here. I brought a wind farm in Germany. It's a two megawatt wind farm. Um, what we do first here is we want to create the transaction plan. So basically the transaction manager now inputs all the assumptions he has before the transaction. Uh, maybe he has a yield assessment so he can add this wind turbine. It has a power of two megawatt. It has a potential production of 6,000 megawatt hours. In this case, he can also add, for example, the availability uh, of 95%, the monthly distribution, and in the end, he gets the expected production over the whole lifetime of the project. So basically, um, where green byte ends with megawatt hours is where we start from the financial part. What we do now is we, we um, based on the production, we try to simulate the returns you can expect. So we add feed-in tariffs you, you're expecting, we add the market price um, for the future. So basically you try to plan all the revenues from the transaction until the project ends. Now you do that for all the contracts you have for the project. So you add up all your OPEX contracts, you add CAPEXs, you add the financing structure and so on. I don't want to go too much into details uh, here now because this is more about the transaction part, but that's basically where we start for the asset management. So if the transaction manager now um, put in all the data, we can go to the financial model section where you get a fully integrated financial plan. So you get a profit and loss, a cash flow statement, and the balance sheet. And important to note here is that this financial model 
always looks the same. It always has the same structure, no matter what kind of technology you have. Is it for a wind farm? Is it for a PV project? Is it for a hydro project? No matter in which country it is or in which project phase it is. So you can basically model all of those projects in the same financial model. And that's really crucial in order to assure that you have the standardization of your financial data. Then of course, based on, based on this data, you can also calculate all the KPIs you need. You can calculate a project IR and equity IR and so on. But so far we are only in the planning stage. So basically what we calculate here is only based on, on future beliefs. And what we want to do now is we want to bring in actual data now. So I will switch to the asset controlling module now, where we can find the same project again. Let's assume that it is in our portfolio now. Um, in the asset controlling section, we have different modules again. We have the management summary, we have different reporting sections, and we have the ledger management. That's where I want to start now, because this is the interface to the accounting data. That's the place where you can import your accounting data. Basically, you can import monthly, leg monthly ledgers here. Um, which you can usually collect from your accounting partner. Now, what is important here is um, that's also similar to what is Green, what Greenbyte is doing for the production part. They have to map some kind of um, turbine errors or turbine codes to their standard um, structure. And that's the same thing we're doing here. So basically we take the accounting data, which can be quite heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, it can have different structures uh, depending on which country it is, which partner it is, and so on. And what we do here is we map this structure to our structure in GreenMatch in order to have a standardized data set here. After we've done that, we can again calculate the full financial model. So basically, we can again uh, calculate provenant loss, cash flow statement, and balance sheet. Now, um, I have to state that it's combined now. We see for each year, or you can also have the monthly view, you can see for each month what was the actual plan. Um, this is the transaction plan you, you had from the beginning. And on the right-hand side, you always see the current data. So um, let's switch back to the yearly view. Um, let's see in the transaction plan we had plan 399,000 uh, euro of sales. And now we can see our current sales were only 392,000. So basically we now have the data set which, which we have this combined data set between the transaction plan, the current data. And as we can see here for the future in 2021, we have the forecast data which is combined for the actual date until March, because we only have actual date until March, and for this updated plan for the rest of the year. And for the future, we then use this updated plan um, we spoke about before. So basically, this is um, all the magic we have to do. We have to standardize all the data we have in order to um, be able to report the data in a standardized way. Now let's switch to the live to date section. Um, basically, this is a good overview of the project, how it is actually doing over the long run. So what we see here is, let's start again with the production. You can see the production for um, the past years. The actual data is the dark blue um, bar and the light blue bar was the initial plan we had we could now actually um, show the forecast as well. The forecast here is our updated plan, which in fact is now still the same as we had um, when we uh, made the transaction plan. And now we can um, immediately see that this might not make too much sense because we now have um, six years of experience or seven years of experience where we can see that our 
actual production was lower than what we planned. And right now we are planning with the same production as we planned initially. So maybe our current estimate for the, for the return figures might be too high. So what we can do now is based on this past data, we can actually um, update your plan. That's what I've done already. For that, we can go into our valuation section as well. And now we can add a new plan here. I've done that already. This is the actualized plan based on March 2021. So let's switch to the production section where we can see our initial plan was 6,000 megawatt hours. Now, if I change to the actualized plan, we can see that I now assume it to be 5,500 megawatt hours. So what I can do now is I can um, update all those values for my updated plan. And let's go again back to the asset controlling section. I can now switch my actualized plan here. I can now say for the future, I want to use this new plan, this actualized plan. I can choose it. And if I go back to the live to date section and um, activate the forecast, I can now see that it is much more aligned with the past data. And maybe this is the best or a better estimate for the future than before. And in the end, um, in the management summary is where everything comes together and all the investors are usually interested in the returns. That is in the end, how attractive an investment is. And here we can, for example, see how is our best estimate for the equity IRR evolving over time. So for example, here we see our initial planned equity IRR in the transaction plan was 6.3%. Now, based on the actual data and this new updated plan, it actually is 5.7%. So it is expected to be a bit lower than initially um, planned. And now we can also show where are those deviations coming from. We see that we had a lot less sales or, or we are expecting less sales over the whole time period. So this will have an impact of minus 1% on the equity IRR. Uh, we can do the same for the OPEXs. We see we had a little bit less OPEXs, which actually has a positive impact on our equity IRR. And to sum up, this is um, a, a little sneak peek of what is possible if you standardize your data. So basically, the hard part is to really standardize your accounting data, your financial modeling data, and then you can start to create beautiful reports and can um, start to dig into the details and analyze where your deviations are coming from. And I would like to close my part with that, um, I brought some more screenshots uh, just to show what is possible if you have the standardized data. You can create um, reports that are individualized um, based on your stakeholders' needs. Um, those are just some examples. I don't want to go into details here. Um, maybe one to mention is that is really interesting are OPEX benchmarks. Uh, that are possible on a portfolio level then. So you could basically uh, benchmark each of your projects. You can um, see how um, is your project compared to the rest of your portfolio. And you can see if you have outliers there. Another really interesting graph is on the bottom right here. This is the IR distribution of your whole portfolio. So you could um, draw a figure here that shows how is your actual IRR evolving over time. And you could also, um, as mentioned here by the colors, you could then um, make segments for all the technologies on the, and you can compare a wind project or all the wind projects of your portfolio to your solar port, uh, projects in the portfolio. And I would like to close my part with another short survey which is with which reporting system used in your company are you already satisfied you can choose between 
or you can choose multiple between technical performance, financial performance on SPV level, financial performance on portfolio level, and none. I will give you a few seconds. Thank you. As I can see, some of you are satisfied with the technical performance monitoring. Um, no one is satisfied with the financial performance on SPV level, a little part on the financial performance on portfolio level, and most are not at all satisfied with the reporting system. So thank you for your attention, and I would like to um, give over to Oliver for a short Q&A session. Yeah, thanks Tobias uh, and Christos for your instructive presentations. Um, as Tobias mentioned, we will now move on to our Q&A session uh, directly with the first question. How is reliability engineering applied within the context of asset management for wind turbines? What are the challenges with implementing reliability engineering? I think uh, that goes into to the direction of Greenbyte, uh, Christos. Yeah, sure. So it's definitely uh, part of the scope and we have briefly touched upon it during the presentation where we categorize the downtime events to the uh, um, our DSPP taxonomy to the turbine uh, components. So from a statistical approach, uh, that would be an element, but of course there are more uh, detailed uh, analytics there. And when it comes to challenges, you know, like in uh, many other cases, it's a bit of a cost benefit or effort benefit uh, exercise, meaning that if you wanna go down to sub-component level, uh, unavoidably, you might have to uh, add qualitative information, which might result in manual work. So how much extra information will you get if you know it's the subcomponent of the gearbox failing, or is it enough to talk about gearbox failures or failure rates and uh, structure your business model accordingly? So a challenge I would see is the trade-off between level of detail and amount of qualitative information and uh, manual work there. All right, thank you. Um, the second question is, uh, is power or weather forecast useful or supportive uh, input for efficient and successful technical and financial asset management? Um, yeah, interesting for both experts. Uh, let's start with the technical part. Uh, yeah, so uh, when we talk about the technical operations, uh, even if we identify an early fault, when we're going to intervene is also a critical decision. So definitely having an accurate weather and production forecast will be one of the criteria for making this decision to go, uh, simply speaking, to go out on a less windy date. Yeah, and from the financial perspective, um, it's, for sure important in the short run to maximize production or maximize uh, the revenues you can collect uh, for the long-term financial perspective it's not that relevant to make forecasting um, because yeah in the financial planning you're usually on a monthly or quarterly level and uh, you cannot yet predict a wind or yeah at least wind for the next quarter i would say Right, thank you. The next question is, what are the challenges in data harmonization and how do they differ between wind and solar? Mm. I can give you this tab. So I've, I would say overall the wind industry is uh, more mature, also given the amount of uh, OEMs uh, out there. So compared to the solar industry where it's still quite uh, diverse, so main challenges, uh, one is data quality. So receiving the data is one exercise, but making sure that uh, what you receive does make sense is a different story. And then when it comes to the harmonization, uh, again, there are some industry uh, guidelines. There have been some efforts to harmonize uh, more mature in the wind side, uh, but uh, definitely a lot of uh, efforts, a few steps to go 
on the solar side of things? I think for us on the financial part, it's um, a bit more mature because we use accounting data and accounting data is actually pretty much standardized. But still, of course, you see a lot of um, different accounting or um, yeah, accounting structures across companies. And that's what I mentioned before. The more partners you have as a company, the more different accounting partners you have, the more uh, different um, accounting structures you see. And the, the more difficult it gets to structure this data to, um, to one standard. So yeah, what I would recommend here is to use as, as less or the less partners possible to keep it simple. Perfect, thank you. Um, one information, we got too many questions for today. Um, what we will do, we will add one last question now and uh, come back to all participants who have open questions um, after the webinar. Um, sorry for that, we'll keep in touch. Uh, yeah, just we will need uh, a few days, sorry for that. So the last question will be, if I use two separate platforms, does it mean that I will need to do everything twice? Do the platforms integrate with each other? Um, if I can take a first step. Yeah, sure. That. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when it comes to Greenbytes side of things, we connect directly to the site and we collect and harmonize the data. And exactly because we identify that there is not a one-stop shop, not one platform <clears throat> fitting all the needs for stakeholder financial and technical asset management. That's why we also expose this information via uh, our API in order to make it easy and transparent to feed other platforms, it being a financial platform or being a specialized platform of uh, different kind of uh, analytics or being your in-house uh, system, uh, whatever that might be. So we make sure everything is available in the API so that whatever action you perform in one system is replicated to the other. You don't have to export, import, download or anything like that. Yeah, that's a part we are currently working on. We do have um, some integrations, uh, but as you um, as you can imagine, you have a lot of different um, tools you have to integrate to, and we currently use this export function via via CSV files because we have heterogeneous um, data or um, tools we have to fit, and we are currently working on opening our API to um, yeah, make it available for all the tools as well. And on the other side, on the input side, where we have to collect the data from accounting um, software, there it really depends on the software our clients are using. If they have an open API, it's possible to collect the data directly. If they don't, uh, then you have to find another way. All right, uh, thank you very much, Christos and Tobias. Uh, so we have reached the end of our webinar. I hope you enjoyed the time with us. Uh, you can give us your feedback in a few seconds by filling in our feedback form. It will be opened automatically in your browser. We would highly appreciate your participation. It really just takes one minute. A special thank you to Christos and the whole Greenby team for our collaboration. And thank you to our audience for your interest, participation, and all, all received questions. Um, we'll keep in touch. See you soon for another event. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.